This is Pete Moore on Halo Talks NYC. I have the pleasure of bringing David Cantor, Tenafly, New Jersey, breaking news, CNN, Wolf Blitzer. We are in Whole Foods. Not a better way to intro than that. So Dave, congratulations. We're gonna talk about keto. We're talking about breakfast, hot, cold, however you want to take it. David's gonna deliver it. Good to see you. Thanks, Pete. Appreciate it. So what brought you into this part of the business? Was there a frustration that you were trying to solve on your own? Did you not see this category and say, this is open? <laughs> well, I've been in this part of the business in natural foods for 20 years on the corporate side. So I grew up really in this industry. I've been in the food space even for years before that. Um, you know, I went to school in the Midwest. I, I actually got interested in food and sustainability and, and gardening really, I know it's really weird, but really early, you know, in college, I started learning how to cook pretty seriously. I ended up moving West to learn how to farm and eventually ran my own organic farm out in New Mexico. And then I went back to school and got a master's degree in nutrition, studying really food and agriculture policy at Tufts University. And then oh. segued that is really roundabout, you know, sort of trajectory, then segued there to Eminem Mars where I was hired as a junior marketer in sort of their skunk works division, helping them launch better for you, like health and nutrition brands, helping them diver diversify their portfolio. I was Before there for a year. Which what brands do they have that are better for you? Because the only thing I see is, you know, chocolates at the, uh, at the bodega. What is uh, Mars have they, in their portfolio that's uh, better for you? Lot. Have you ever heard of Kind Bar? Oh, oh yeah, yeah, sure, sure. So they bought Kind Bar. They, they bought Kind Bar. They've made, they've made a number of really smart acquisitions. But back then, that was um, they weren't so active on the M and A side. But they were really trying to incubate little brands of their own. I worked on a little organic food brand called Seeds of Change. Helped launch that into chocolate. Worked on like a better for you chocolate brand called Coco Via. Just great formative experience. Great training, marketing training, and really from there, sort of climbed up the marketing ladder. Um, and most recently I joined a company called Dr. Prager Sensible Foods, which is best known as a veggie burger brand. And I ran marketing and innovation and R and D for that company for eight years. And we grew that, you know, we grew that brand really aggressively, sort of five X in the eight years I was there. We sold it to PE in early 21. I stuck around for almost a year and then jump ship to launch Folk Revival. After like 20 years of growing brands for other people, I I was really itching to do it for myself. So, so how do you feel about being an entrepreneur here with, uh, with the limited balance sheet and um, a lot of uh, control that you have that you don't have to report up to anyone? You know, I sort of feel like my experience, uh, you know, Working on small brands, you know, at Prager's was really good training for this. So when you're when you're on small brand, all the you know, 20 years of working in the food industry, but always on natural and organic brands, always on startups, always on like high growth emerging brands. And as you know, as a marketer, you have to wear a lot a lot of hats. They don't have deep budgets for you know big national campaigns. Oftentimes, you really have to be able to like make your dollars stretch and. Be creative, think out of the box, be a little scrappy. And I have 20 years of that training. I think that served me well to sort of kick start folk revival. Gotcha. So what brought you into this category? Did you have a epiphany? Were you on the, you know, in the grocery store and said, you know, where is this? And it, and it wasn't there? I mean, it, it so a few different a few different answers to that. One answer is um like a lot, you know, my ideas come from everywhere. Um, my, the ideas can come from, you know, singing in the shower, playing guitar, listening to music, working out at the gym, whatever it is, or eating a bowl of oatmeal and, you know, just being annoyed that it's, you know, filled with carbs. And I think that was sort of the epiphany here, which is I was coming home from the gym regularly. I was back at the gym after leaving my last job. Uh, I was working out aggressively. I was working on Folk Revival and the brand architecture started taking shape before the product was taking shape. So I was already, I knew I wanted it to be functional. I knew I wanted it to involve like heirloom and heritage ingredients. I saw some white space. We were doing some innovation brainstorming and, I, and, I, and oatmeal was rising to the top as, as an idea that um, sort of checked a lot of the boxes for a good innovation idea. And I, you know, and I thought to myself, I enjoy eating oatmeal. I'm eating oatmeal all the time. I'm replacing my oatmeal with all these nuts and seeds just to displace right. the carbs with some protein and fat. And sort of voila, 
uh, we I thought, I think we have our first contender here, our first product. Where did the name Folk Revival come from? So, look, first of all, I'm sort of a music nerd. So I'll, I'll, I'll start off with that. I confess I'm sort of a music nerd. Um, and so I liked the ring of it. Sometimes, you know, brand names, they can like roll right off your tongue. And this one rolled right off the tongue for me. The Folk really speaks to the... The, the people part, the human nutrition part, right? The functional nutrition part and the revival um, really speaks to the heirloom and heritage, heritage ingredients, which I referenced a minute ago, which is really what we're trying to do. That's sort of the mission of the brand to, to deliver like real functional nutrition by reviving heirloom and heritage ingredients. And the sort of hero heritage ingredient in our hot cereal are acorns. So here's our hot cereal, show it the camera. Yep. And, you know, acorns are a heritage food. They're consumed in pockets around the world. In North America, they're not widely consumed, but they are consumed and sort of prized as an important heritage food amongst many Native uh, tribes and communities. And there's a real opportunity to introduce acorns to a wider audience and really be like the first national brand to bring acorns to market, sort of rolling out a new food ingredient similar to, you know, chia or quinoa or coconut water, which 25 years ago, Americans did not consume these things, essentially. Um, and now so they're another supplier for, uh, for acorns. Did you go to like, the density of squirrel population and basically you know, take over that territory? Right. So, so I, I talked to this community of squirrels. I talked to their elders and they agreed <laughs> to, uh, to sell me some. That's nice. <laughs> That'd be great. That'd be great if the animals actually had some, economic benefit to the economy um no but, but was there a big acorn um producer or did you, did you construct one yeah so so there are very few places around the world where acorns are like sort of processed in an industrial scale so yeah. i've been able to partner with one of them and they've been truly a partner in fact they've been an early investor in the business so not only are they selling us acorns but they've actually written a check and are really sort of vested in our success, which has been terrific. And, you know, acorns are interesting. You can't pick an acorn off the ground or off of a tree and eat it. We're all familiar with the oak trees. We're all familiar with the acorns that litter our driveways or backyards right. or parks or playgrounds, but you can't eat them. Sort of similar to olives. Like you can't pick an olive right. off of a tree and eat it. It just wouldn't taste good. It would be bitter. It's the same with acorns. You have to process them. And it's pretty laborious to process them. You can do it at home, and I've done it at home, but most people don't um, because it is quite time consuming. It can take up to a week, that type of thing. Um, so unless you're doing it at like a big industrial scale, um, it doesn't really make sense. So fortunately, we have that sort of scalable supply solution in place today. And how do you, um, how do you look at the cost on the input side? And what, what price point are you trying to reach? Obviously, people that are on you know, keto diets and you know, take better care of themselves and you know, obviously Whole Foods, you know, they're willing to pay more. You know, it's a question of whether you need to be at a, a, a higher price point if you want to hit the mass market. So when you think about the input costs of an acorns versus oatmeal, you know, do you have to be at a higher price point? And do you want to be at a higher price point given the consumers who are on keto are probably, you know, more active and, and care about their health and more disposable income is going towards, you know, their, their inputs or their fuel? Sure, sure. So, yeah, look, we're always trying to manage our, our costs, and there's cost efficiencies that come with scale. So right now we have, um, you know, and in terms of uh, sort of pricing strategy, we're really aiming to be on shelf around a dollar more than the other sort of better for you, uh, you know, natural organic, um, natural organic cups of oatmeal. So, you know, the analogy for that might be, what happened with like, say, Greek yogurt, again, approximately 20 years ago, which is the category was dominated by, you know, Dannon and Yoplait and these sort of like sugary yogurt options. And then Chobani and Faye came in and really shook up the category. And what they offered was they offered something that was priced more, you know, at a, at a premium, about a dollar more a cup or more, um, but they offered protein. And I think that's a good analogy for us, which is we're going to be about a dollar more on shelf but we're offering 20 grams of protein versus most of the other sort of oatmeal cups are anywhere from like seven grams up to, you know, maybe 12 grams, 14 grams. We're at 20. And then unlike all of them, we're really low in carbs. So 
works, a fraction of the carbs. They all have 30, 40 grams of carbs, essentially, depending on the variety. We, we have less than five, um, depending on the variety of folk revival. Um, so much more protein, far fewer carbs. It is keto. It's, we're not leading with keto, but it is keto. It is paleo. It is gluten-free, grain-free. Um, we're, and then of course we are very much sort of sustainability focused and mission driven in terms of reviving these, these heirloom foods. So when you take a look at, you know, from a marketing standpoint and being in this industry for, for 20 years, some, some groups have the luxury of doing national commercials or a Super Bowl commercial. You, you referenced that you bootstrapping several brands for large companies. Um, when you, when you came up with the folk revival, what are some of the things that you said, Hey, I'm going to kind of go this route or, you know, anything that's, you know, maybe a grassroots or guerrilla marketing. We've got a lot of people that are in brands that are localized for health clubs and fitness studios. Um, and sometimes they'll come up with like, buy one, get one free or like first month free and, you know, no zero enrollment. I'm like, let's be a little more creative. Um, so what are some of the things that you have found to be successful that you kind of, you know, say, okay, this is how I'm going to do it because it has to be grassroots and that's how I want to market it. So I get that. Right. So it's going to have to be grassroots. So I, what I have found is the most efficient use of dollars are spent actually in the store. There's nothing that sort of drives trial more than a shelf tag, you know, at Whole Foods that says 20% off or a dollar off that you're in a store, there's 10,000 items to look at and you have to grab people's attention and that grabs people's attention much more effectively than a social post or, you know, anything. People aren't seeing social posts from running out to their store generally to purchase the product. Um, so being really smart and efficient with spend, you know, with really shopper marketing, trade marketing dollars uh, for one. But, you know, sort of longer term vision. I love the idea of talking to, on um, getting this in the hands of many people at, at music festivals across the country, concerts. There's no reason we shouldn't be, you know, leveraging the name, leveraging sort of that audience and this product, things like that, whether it's a, also events, like whether it be, um, you know, uh, uh, Spartan races or Tough Mudder, or those types of events, also really great sort of targeted audience. I think a lot of those consumers are already interested in the brand and purchasing and repeating on the brand. Um, so those types of partnerships are are in our future. Mm -hmm. And then when you look at the uh, the growth of the influencer market, having a celebrity or an athlete potentially invested in the brand, you know, and, and basically have that as something that they've they take themselves, you know, basically some free marketing related to that. Have you thought through that? Is that a good investment, bad investment? Um, obviously, it's kind of no, a wild it's a good west. Investment. It's good. Yeah, it is. It is. You have to you have to be targeted in terms of you have to be sort of strategic, and the investor has to be strategic, right? It needs to be a good fit. It, it wouldn't make sense for someone who's known for you know something totally unrelated. But if there's someone living a, um, you know, who's been on a weight loss journey, who's been um, who, an athlete, someone who's living a healthy lifestyle, that type of thing. It makes a ton of sense. And we would welcome those conversations and that investment. We've had a couple conversations uh, in the past, but it was a while ago and we were just really too small. So um, hopefully with the, you know, with the increased visibility that I think we'll gain from being on shelf at Whole Foods, that will help. I think, you know, it's pretty dynamic. The company is changing month to month. So um, even by the time this airs, I think the company is going to look a little bit different than it does today. Gotcha. And just related to Whole Foods, obviously, everyone that's on a business development role says, hey, we got a meeting, you know, we're going to close this deal in 30 days. Never happens. Um, what, what kind of timeline, given your experience over 20 years, where you say, hey, look, we're going to have a first meeting. Let me just tell you, nothing's going to happen for X number of months. What's the under over on that? I can't speak to that. The, the, the sell-in process for, for, for retail, for grocers is is at least six months, essentially. There's probably some, uh, you know, strange exceptions that have happened, that have happened to me and will happen to others, but it's essentially a six to 12 month selling cycle. So for instance, uh, with Whole Foods, I think we sent samples in in April, if I'm not mistaken, April or May, but I think it was April. Um, we just heard from them now and we'll be shipping in December and on shelf along the Eastern seaboard in January. So that gives you a flavor, April to January. Um, and that's not uncommon. Most of the retailers operate at that uh, sort of selling cycle. In food service with restaurants, with chain accounts, it's far longer. 
typically. It's even far longer. And for the entrepreneurs out there, some of the decisions that are made early stage of who's going to, who am I going to hire next? Uh, and what does that roster look like? Um, how have you thought about that from your past experience on, you know, do I need somebody in logistics or do I need somebody in sales? Uh, do I need somebody in research? Do I need business development? Like those are key decisions on where you spend those dollars. So how have you kind of managed to say, this is who I need. This is what their pedigree might be or experience. Um, it is the job title. Do you speak to that? Yeah. So, so every, every business is different. Certainly even every food company, it's different. Um, typically a first hire might be a, a head of sales, um, and some sort of sales and marketing support staff. It's very, very common. It's not, you know, universal, but pretty typical in my case, sort of pre-launch. Remember I left my job in the end of 21. I worked on this all throughout 22 with, developing sort of the brand architecture and the and the recipes and finding a factory and building a website and all that that was all that was essentially a year's worth of work all throughout 22 we didn't turn the website on until early 23 essentially the first week of 2023 so um in that case in my case i you know look i believe in like you know if you're going to go fast go alone you want to go far like go together you know that old adage so i definitely believe in you know going further together i ended up bringing on five different partners and it was really dictated by needs fortunately from my time in the industry i have lots of industry contacts lots of people i love and trust and you know admire and um and they certainly have skill sets that are different than mine and complementary so um, from the branding side, we brought in a, an amazing sort of branding uh, and marketing partner, um, which I think I can mention. Their name is Special Operations, um, and they helped develop the packaging and the initial website and that type of thing. Really sort of smart, strategic uh, thinkers, really creative. And then as we got further, I needed a finance person. I brought in an old finance uh, contact of mine, former CFO from Dr. Prager's. We needed R and D. I brought in an old Mars R and D um, manager, uh, DTC. Same thing. I brought sort of a DTC guru on board. Same with social. I brought on like when it was time to do social. Social costs money, of course, and we were able to bring in a partner who's sort of putting in sweat equity, like all of us, and who's willing to sort of give us um, some amazing social content, um, which we ordinarily wouldn't be able to afford. Um, so yeah, those aren't hires per se, but it was about sort of bringing in the right partners and not being scared of parting with some equity to make sure that we can sort of get this ship off the ground. And what about the, uh, talk about the crowdfunding decision uh, to go that route and not go into, you know, venture or, uh, you know, friends and family uh, raise. Obviously there's a lot of talk about crowdfunding. I think there's, it's getting more um, legitimized, you know, from a governance standpoint, um, which is good um, mm-hmm. from it, from getting customers to become investors, obviously in a, in a brand, uh, you know, that's a nice way to yeah. have somebody, you know, tell their friends, oh, I'm an investor in this, go, go try it. So probably a business development and a, an equity play at the same time. Um, but there's a lot of work that needs to be done for that. Uh, so how, how did you kind of manage through the pros and cons of, of going through that process? So, so we raised some money. I've been bootstrapping this uh, for the most part myself. I have not done a proper friends and family round. We did receive some early investment. I mentioned our Acorn uh, supplier was an early investor, one or two others. Uh, but these are challenging fundraising times, as you know, and your listeners know. So we started exploring crowdfunding uh, just a little while ago. This campaign is going to go live around um, in just a few weeks. And it's going to be live on WeFunder. So if you look for Folk Revival on WeFunder.com, probably under the food and beverage section, you'll see our campaign. It will be live by the time this show airs, I presume. And um, yeah, there's a lot of upfront work. There's actually some, you know, some initial sort of upfront expenses you have to budget for accounting and legal and produce a sharp looking video and things like that. Once again, fortunately, I have a lot of these sort of resources in our amongst the, the six of us, the initial partners. So um, special ops who created the sort of the, the branding and the packaging also was able to shoot the video. So I have that luxury. Not every entrepreneur who's exploring crowdfunding will have that, but there's ways to do it efficiently. And I think we're going to have some success. Awesome. 
Well, feel free to use the HALO uh, acronym to describe the, uh, the sector that you're in. Um, I will definitely try and become a, uh, uh, an avid uh, eater of your, uh, of your folk revivals. And uh, let's see where distribution can be had, you know, or pressurize the, the trainers and the, the certified nutritionists that we know and the dietitians um, and get this, uh, you know, top of mind. And congrats on the progress. It seems like you bootstrapped this without a lot of, um, you know, wasted investment, which is, you know, you got to think about that as a big win also, right? That's true. Yeah. No, I, thank you very much. And thanks for the opportunity to, uh, to talk with you today. Awesome.